everybody. Uh, I want to thank the Gill Foundation. This is the second uh, outgiving at which uh, considerable attention has been paid to the, in the issue of uh, international LGBT rights, global LGBT rights, and global giving. Thank you for putting that emphasis on this very important issue. Um, our job this evening is to move beyond uh, the boundaries of the very courageous work that so many of the people that you've heard uh, in the last day are doing here in the United States and the major challenges that we have as an LGBT rights movement to talk about uh, the interests and the challenges and the movements uh, to, uh, to fight for LGBT rights in other parts of the world and the role that you as philanthropists can play. It's very important that we understand the boundaries that, that separate us in some ways uh, from our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, but unite groups. And we are united around municipalities, around states, around uh, national boundaries, around regional boundaries. And these are the spaces in which laws are created, in which uh, resources are allocated, in which identities form. And so they're very important for us as LGBT activists. But in the last two years, I've had the opportunity, since I've had the opportunity to speak with you in Las Vegas, our gay world has gotten a lot smaller, measurably smaller, I'd say, in, in the ways in which our lives intersect and they overlap and they sometimes conflict as global LGBT citizens. To take just one example, the struggle, the very important struggle for marriage uh, equality here in the United States and for family rights has had an impact both a positive and a negative impact on LGBT movements in the global South and East. Conservative governments in many parts of the world use marriage as a red herring to rally conservative forces against LGBT rights struggles. Anti-marriage constitutional amendments and laws have been introduced in El Salvador, Honduras, Nigeria, Kenya, and the Democratic Republic of Congo in the last few years. In countries such as Morocco and Bahrain, anytime people are arrested uh, for, for being gay or lesbian, the media calls it uh, a gay wedding. And this provides uh, an untrue rationale for arbitrary arrest and detention. At the same time, the desire to see their relationships accepted and honored by community has never been stronger for people around the world. And I just refer to the, the cases of two uh, Malawians that we worked on this year, Tionge Chimbalanga and Stephen Mongeza, who were arrested and spent more than a year and a half um, in the very notorious Chichiri prison in Malawi because they stood up and decided that they were gonna have a, a, a marriage and engagement ceremony to celebrate their love. It's the best of times for our movement globally, and it's the worst of times. Um, there have been some sweeping changes in the world, and I just want to cite a few examples of the best of times. Arguably, the most important uh, event that occurred in the last uh, period since we last met was the reading down of the sodomy law in India uh, in July of 2009. And we're, while we're still not sure of the exact impact that this is going to have on India overall, uh, we know that this was hugely important. Of the world's largest democracy to make a decision that sodomy laws are wrong, are antiquated, are out of date, will have tremendous effect, particularly on countries in the global south and east. Countries like Portugal, Iceland, Argentina, and the municipality of Mexico have provided provisions for the protection and for uh, acceptance of same-sex marriages. Um, our movement has become variegated in countries in which Previously, there was maybe only one LGBT organization working at the national level. There are now organizations working specifically for transgender rights, or specifically for lesbian rights, or specifically for the rights uh, of young people. And as our movement grows, we are able to focus globally on more specific issues um, other than just survival. But we're able to focus issues on, uh, or focus on issues such as blackmail and extortion. And I'll just do a little shameless self-promotion and just tell you about the book that's in your folder, which is our new report on blackmail and extortion, which shows that in countries in sub-Saharan Africa, 25% of the gay men uh, interviewed reported that they had personally been blackmailed in their lives. The struggle to focus attention on the specific 
HIV-related needs of, of men who have sex with men and trans women are finally paying off with increased funding being made available for prevention, treatment, and HIV care programs for men who have sex with men and transgender women in countries in the global south by the United States, the Global Fund, and other donors. And at the United Nations as well, we've made some uh, incredible strides. Uh, my own organization was able to finally achieve, after three years of fighting for it, uh, observer status at ECOSOC, for example. So some of the pos those are some of the positives. And, but rather than simply presenting you with a litany of the very substantial challenges that we've been facing, and I could do that, I could sit up here all evening and talk to you about the arbitrary arrest and detention, the torture, the challenges, the, the challenges to organizing. Rather than doing that, what I'd rather do is let you take a look at a short video that was uh, created by Academy Award winning uh, director and filmmaker Roger Ross Williams that I think is emblematic of some of the struggles that LGBT people are facing around the world and the rather nefarious role that is being played by some of the same foes uh, and opponents that we are facing off against here in the United States. Can you please roll the video? The family is the oldest and arguably most influential Christian conservative organization in Washington and one of the very few that's really international. The dictator Bigan in Museveni has been the family's key man for Africa since 1986. And he's their guy. They began in the early 90s building a, a, a broader base and I think they were sort of the vanguard of the great sort of American evangelical intervention in Uganda. God loves Uganda. His light is shining in this nation. If you take the, the continent of Africa, the map, and you put it over yourself, if you hang it right in front of yourself, over the heart is Uganda. 1877 is when Christianity came in this country. All the laws are made from the Bible, with the Bible's view, whereby the Sodom laws that are oppression and discriminatory, they have their roots from those Victorian laws. A group of American evangelicals traveled to a faraway land, a place where homosexuality is already a crime, to speak out against the gay it. The movement is an evil institution. One month after the Americans' visit, a bill was introduced. The anti-homosexuality bill. The new bill would impose much harsher punishments, including life imprisonment and even the death penalty. It's not that Uganda hates homosexuals but we hate the sin of it. The Bible talks clearly of it, because look at what it's done in other nations. The American evangelicals came here, where they are coming from, the, it was no longer greener pasture. They couldn't preach this homophobia to anyone. But now when they come here, the pastures are so green that because of poverty in the people, they accept anything. So they made all the parents, the whole country, hate us. No to Sodomy! No We say no to homosexuals! We don't allow homosexuals! Because of elections next year, they are coming up with this bill to divert people's attention rather than asking for putting medicine in hospitals, construction of roads. But now they are looking at men, mature men, having sex with another man in the name of protecting the traditional family. Which traditional family I don't see it being protected anyway. Because now if you report my neighbor, my neighbor is going to report my son, eventually killing one another because of revenge. That's a genocide which I can see. It looks like the bill is locked up in committee now, and that does have to do with Museveni realizing that this was going to hurt him internationally. But on top of it, he'd gotten all the benefits. He'd whipped up uh, a, a, a witch hunt. He had convinced Ugandans that he was standing up for the decadent West. He wins, and Uganda loses. Then recently they said, now, if this bill, parliament is failing to pass it, they know where we are. So religion has really caused so much havoc into spreading hate rather than love. Last week, a man was beaten to death with a hammer in his home. At the man's funeral, though, the local pastor leading the service turned from eulogizing the man who had been killed to instead railing against homosexuality. The pastor made clear that he would not be part of helping the dead man rest in peace. He would not conduct the burial. A former Anglican bishop who was excommunicated in his country for favoring gay rights, he takes over the service. The whole world has got its eyes on Uganda because of what has happened to David Kato. For his being a defender 
or human rights. And when we have rights, they don't discriminate. Everybody created by God. It may be different from me. Myself, I'm straight. I'm not LGBT. But I've known these people who are LGBT. I respect them for what they are. And I believe they are going to heaven. Like you others, they are going to heaven. David Kidder was a friend of ours, and we miss him. I want to introduce uh, Sass Sassot, who, is the, who conducted the first comprehensive study of transgender women in the Philippines. Sass uh, co-founded the Society of Transsexual Women of the Philippines, STRAP. She is communications officer in a for Asia at the International Lesbian and Gay Association. Uh, and a member of the Transgender Asia Research Center. Uh, uh, Dorothy Sander is a veteran activist and philanthropist in our community, uh, has been active in our struggle in ways small and large. Um, she is the co-chair of the board of the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, and she's been on the board of several other LGBT organizations, including the LGBT Center of New York. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Here. My pleasure. So, um, Seth, I think I'll start with you, and I'd like to ask you, um, I know you've had to uh, deal with the issue of religion and the ways in which religion uh, is used uh, against LGBT people in the Philippines. Can you tell us a bit about your experiences uh, fighting homophobia that's been related to religion? Um, thank you, Carrie, and good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dorothy. Um, before I start, um, I would like to thank the Gill Foundation and Eagle Hurt for inviting me to be here today. As we have seen in the unfolding of tragic events in Uganda, we have become aware of the influence of evangelical Christianity, of how evangelical Christianity is being used as a motivation to hate, to inflict suffering on other people and you know, to influence people to actually kill LGBT people in my country, though we haven't heard yet um, stories like that of David Cato. We are now experiencing the influence, the sinister influence of, Christ of evangelical Christianity in my country. Pro-life Philippines, which is an enormously affluent and tremendously politically influential organization in my country has long um, established its commitment to fight uh, anti-life issues. The anti-life issues, um, they said, are divorce, euthanasia, abortion, contraception, pornography, and homosexuality. Right now, um, contraception is the hot issue. Actually, one posh village in the Philippines right now has a local ordinance criminalizing the selling and the buying of condoms. And that posh village is known to be a haven of rich um, people who are connected to evangelical Christians. Now, as for um, LGBT issues, um, in the past few years, we have seen we have seen and experienced the gravity of the influence of evangelical groups in my country. In 2002, sorry, in December 2001, a congressman that has strong ties with evangelical groups filed a bill to limit marriage in the Philippines to natural born men and women. In 2006, a chair, um, the ch uh, a congressman who has a strong tie to evangelical groups, serve as the chairperson of the House Committee on Civil, Civil, Political, and Human Rights. And he used his chairmanship to block the reading of the anti-discrimination bill during that time. And after three years, in, 2000, in December 2009, this same congressman 
filed a bill in Congress to criminalize same-sex marriage and same-sex relationship in the Philippines, which is, of course, unheard of you know, before. Um, in 2007, our Supreme, Court our Supreme Court decided that transsexual people cannot change um, their sex on their documents. If you're going to read the Supreme Court decision, you cannot ignore the fact that the religious beliefs of these judges actually influence their decision. That decision actually started with a verse from the Bible. Mm. Now, um, you know, there are lots of in instances of, there's a long list actually mm -hmm. of how um, religious fundamentalism is acting against us in, in, in our part of the region, not only in the Philippines. For example, in Indonesia in March 2008, in, in last year in Indonesia in March 2010, I was one of the activists who was present during the Ilga, World, Ilga Asia conference in Surabaya, Indonesia. And I have personally witnessed how the Islam Defenders, how the Islam Defenders Front or FBI, you know, stopped the conference, sieged the hotel that we were staying at. And I have seen how the police officers actually bowed to the demands of these um, religious fundamentalists. And it was, the whole drama lasted only for 10 hours, but those 10 hours were, felt like an eternity of terror and horror. And after a month, the same group attacked a human rights training program for transgender people in West Java. If you're going to see the news coverage of the event, you would see how the police officers just stood there and just, you know, let these people um, attack um, transgender participants in that event shouting that say that warrior, warriors are garbage, that they don't have a right to exist in this world. You've mentioned violence against transgender people in Asia. Could you tell us maybe a little bit more about what are some of the main uh, challenges that transgender people are facing in the Philippines? Um, you know, Curry, I think there is this growing belief that because of the high social visibility of transgender people in the Philippines or in other countries in Southeast Asia, that we are, you know, more socially accepted than transgender people in other parts of the world. This is far from true. Um, a French journalist based in my country once asked me um, whether this social acceptance of transgender, this seeming social acceptance of transgender people contradicts our claim that we are socially discriminated. You know, of course, we all know that there is a gulf of disparity between passive tolerance and social acceptance. In my country, what, they're, what these people are just witnessing is not necessarily social acceptance. What they are witnessing is the fierceness of the courage of transgender people in Southeast Asia to live their lives despite the rampant presence of discrimination, violence, and marginalization. These issues we experience in all areas of our lives, from our families, from our school and universities, and from our employers. Domestic violence remains, remains an undocumented and unchallenged reality in Southeast Asia. And, and I think that this is because there is this um, cultural acceptance that it is right for family to control their children, including their children's gender identity and gender expression. It is true that in Southeast Asian countries, including the Philippines, transgender people can attend schools and universities, but it doesn't mean that the gender identity and expression of transgender people can, will be actually respected by this educational institution. I, for once, experienced being, you know, prevented to take the entrance examination of one school in the Philippines because I'm transgender. As for employment, there is no anti-discrimination bill in any Southeast Asian country. And because of this, employers can routinely reject transgender applicants with impunity. Those who get, who get you know, accepted to work, um, it doesn't mean that they can be transgender at work. Of course, they can transgender inside themselves, but can they express themselves? 
Can, can they express their gender openly? No. Can they use the restroom appropriate to their gender identity? No. Um, do their health insurance, do the private health insurance of these companies provide for trans-specific healthcare? No. Um, the, infl the influx of multinational companies in, in Southeast Asia might, the, might seem beneficial to transgender people, especially that most of these companies have non-discrimination policies that explicitly say that you know, they don't discriminate based on gender identity and expression. But not all of these corporations actually enforce these policies. In my country, whether you believe it or not, IBM Philippines once had a no cross-dressing policy, a written no cross-dressing policy. Now, when it comes to access to healthcare, you know, access to trans-specific healthcare in Southeast Asia is either law or non-existent at all. It is only in Singapore. Singapore is the only Southeast Asian country that has a national policy on sex reassignment surgery. But in other countries in, in Southeast Asia, we don't. Thailand doesn't even have a national policy on these things, even though the Thailand is known to be the hub of sex reassignment surgery you know, all over the world. Um, in the Philippines and in most countries in Asia, trans people used um, hormones, take hormones without any medical supervision at all. Well, because, you know, we can easily buy um, hormones over the counter without prescription at all. But of course, there are also stories that medical, um, medical practitioners refuse to medically supervise the hormone intake of transgender people because of religious reasons. Now, um, another issue that we're facing is the lack of gender recognition laws in our country. Again, it is only Singapore that allow post-transsexual, um, um, post-operative transsexual people to change their sex on their identity cards, but not on their birth certificates. Now, the, this lack of law has serious legal implications. For example, in Vietnam last year, a transsexual woman was gang raped. Now, the, now she was told that she cannot sue um, those people who gang raped her because she's not legally a woman. Police violence is also very high in the region. Um, we have witnessed it in Indonesia. In Malaysia, there, is the, there are these so-called um, religious, um, religious, religious enforcement officers. Um, the laws on no cross-dressing no cross laws, public nuisance, nuisance laws, anti-prostitution laws, are all being used by police, uh, by the authorities, to harass and persecute transgender people in my country. Now, this violence is not only being perpetrated by police officers, even ordinary people are perpetuating this. Last year in March, there was a Facebook group that was started, and it was um, a Facebook group emerged from, from, from the Philippines, and it's called Sunugin Ang Bading. Sunugin in Bading in English means burn um, gay men and trans women. In that, on that Facebook, Facebook page, the moderator posted pictures of young trans children for, to be mocked and ridiculed by all the members of that group. Um, fortunately, um, Facebook, um, you know, um, removed the page. Lastly, the pathologization of gender variance, which is enshrined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association and the International Classification of Diseases of World Health Organization, is not helping us. It only takes a matter of time before the forces against us can use gender identity disorder as a tool to further the stigmatization, social marginalization, and discrimination against transgender people in Southeast Asia. We have already witnessed it in Thailand before, and now we're, it's, it only, you know, it's a matter of time for us to witness it in other parts of Southeast Asia. Thanks, that's an incredible list of uh, challenges that you're facing. Um, Dorothy, I wanted to bring you into the discussion. Um, you know, through the work that you've been doing with organizations like Astrea and Iglehurk, and you've heard these stories, and how have you structured your philanthropy and your giving to address these issues? 
first of all, it's so important to be able to deal with the homophobia on, uh, on a global basis. Uh, our friends, our, our, all the donors that we know have difficulty uh, understanding why we ask for money to be working overseas. And the response is typically, you know, we don't have our rights here. I would like to focus my money here. But, but in fact, I mean, one of the good things of Eagle Herc being part of the U, now in the UN NGO on ECOSOC um, is, is that we can get people to understand that the United Nations, although in the United States is played down really quite a lot, does have a lot of say in smaller countries and other countries around the world. <clears throat> and, and historically, the United States, and still today, operates within the United Nations uh, under an exceptionalism policy that except for the, Uni except for the United States, it's okay for others. And, it, and that is the policy of the United States within the UN on that exceptionalism basis. But we can, we can also deal with our foreign nations, other, our friends. They actually push the United States into making decisions and forming opinions. Uh, it was Ireland when Mary Robinson was the president of Ireland. Uh, who worked and helped with actually England at the time on the English issues of, of they were just allowing gays and lesbians to serve in the military in the United Kingdom at the time. And, it, and Mary Robinson, although not in Ireland and she couldn't push her own country, she was able to sort of deal with the UK people. Now it was also the UK who helped push us a little on that issue saying, you know, our men and women are fighting besides your men and women in Iraq, and we don't have those issues. So we see that on a, on a foreign friendly basis that, that the United States does get pushed when we can deal with issues that are overseas. So that's sort of one issue. And that's how I try to tell my friends who are donors who who say, you know, we don't want to spend money over there, we'd rather do it here. Uh, but in fact, it's, it's a lot of foreign nations that push us uh, in that arena, especially when we can invoke uh, various UN treaties like the Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and, and that's the tact I try to take with educating my friends in trying to see what is necessary and how, how events overseas really affect us here. Okay, and Tess, I'd sort of like to ask you the same question from the perspective of an activist working um, in, 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 in Asia. Why should U.S. donors um, and how can U.S. donors care? Um, with so many challenges happening here in the United States around our own movement, um, what connection would you like U.S. donors to make with the movement in the Philippines and elsewhere in Asia? Just like in other parts of the world, you know, whether in Africa, Europe, North America, or Latin America, and in Asia, transgender people have enormous passion. What is lacking in our movement is not passion, but funding. Um, of course, we cannot live by passion alone. Um, although, although. We can try. We can try. <laughs> although, so although that we lack, um, you know, we lack funding, we have creative ways of addressing our issues, though we have limited resources. Nonetheless, this will not be sustainable in the long term. And this will not take us you know, as far and as fast as we would like to be um, to the vision that we would like to have in our, uh, to, to the vision of society that we would like to have in our particular countries. Um, as, you, as, you real, as you all know, um, meaningful and lasting responses to our issues can only be achieved with the integration of passion, competence, and resources. 
For passion without competence and resources is just motivation. And competence without passion and resources is just accumulated knowledge. And resources without passion and competence is just that, resources. So I think, why should you care? You know why? Because our enemies are globalizing hate. We don't have any, we don't have any weapon against the, the hate dollar. We don't have any weapon against the discriminatory dollar that is being injected to our countries by evangelical missionaries coming from North America. We don't have the resources to challenge the enormous resources of these people that they use to propagate their propaganda of hate towards us. We don't have the capacity, the, the organizational capacity, to actually focus and dedicate our lives in the long term to address these issues. Just like, one, just like the organization in Malaysia once said, that you know, Malaysian transsexual would like to challenge these laws, but we don't have the money. We, a, lot of, a lot of us would rather you know, focus, on getting in, focus on how to get food on our table than how to address human rights and how to, to forward social progress in our communities. So I think it's time for us to globalize hope so that we can counter the globalization of hate. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I want to ask you both one, one more question, um, a practical question, um, and that is um, once donors have decided that they want to give to LGBT causes outside of the United States, how should they go about doing it? Should they support groups like STRAP and like SMUG that we saw in the video working so bravely in Uganda directly, or should they give to funding intermediaries like Australia, the American Jewish World Service, or the Global Fund for Women, or organizations that do capacity building for partners such as Iglehurt. How, how, should, we, how should donors make those, those gifts? Well, it, it would be great if donors could make those gifts to everyone, and in, in overseas as well as here. But there are logistical and legal issues. <clears throat> um, first of all, we have the Patriot Act in this country and you just can't be writing checks for $25,000 and send them to Uganda. They'll come knocking on your door. Uh, so, and then, then you have logistical issues of those under thresholds amount, if, you know, sending money to like Smug, for example. Uh, it's not like they have lots of checking accounts over there. So the administrative fees for an American to send money there, it would be eaten up. By, by, and, and Smug would wind up with very little. So from, from that perspective, you know, we're unlike the Catholic Church that can move millions of dollars by wire transfer without reporting to any government. We don't have that capability. So, so generally speaking, larger sums of money, or almost any US money, is, is better put in an intermediary uh, of whoever your, your heart is with in, in, a, in, a, in a group. You can earmark it. You could say to Australia or to Eagle Herc or to the Global Fund for Women, uh, here's money that's going to go to working on LGBT issues in Iraq or in the Middle East or in Palestine. Um, <clears throat> Eagle Herc has those kinds of earmarking. Australia does exactly that with their earmarking of money. So it, it could be done directly, it could be done uh, t to some groups, and in some countries uh, you can do that. But generally speaking, uh, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, uh, it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, if you wanted to just help fund a project there, other than a foundation sending their money over. Seth, could you respond? I think you can do both. You can, you can, you can donate directly to the organization, but not all organizations have an online presence. Not all organizations in Southeast Asia uses English. So I think a combination of both is necessary because foundations um, have the, cap the capability to actually, you know, tr understand, um, they can invest on understanding the local languages of these organizations and everything. And, 
and that. So I think y you have to do both. Okay, great. I'd like to refer uh, you all to a couple of uh, uh, publications that are in your packet, both of which were produced by the Arcus Foundation, um, one on expanding global philanthropy and giving out globally, that sort of walks folks through um, how to give globally and uh, what the sort of parameters and who are some of the organizations, both here in the United States and around the world that you can give to globally to impact on uh, the struggle for LGBT rights uh, in other parts of the world. Um, you know, we've been talking about ways in which our, our movement is going global and hopefully encouraging you as donors to think about going beyond the borders of the United States to, to have impact, because that's what we're all concerned about is impact and change and making life better for uh, our brothers and sisters around the world. I'd just like to leave you, I think, with one example of a new tool that our movement uh, that has been developed over the course of the last few years. Um, uh, spe it's specifically the Yogyakarta principles that some of you may have had, uh, have heard about. And it is a document um, that firmly and squarely situates uh, LGBT rights, our claims for LGBT rights within existing human rights law. Um, and will be uh, and has already been an incredible tool for fighting for LGBT rights um, in, in countries that have uh, committed themselves to international human rights treaties like the well, like the International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and Economic and Social Rights. And what the Yogyakarta Principles do is they say that our rights are already part of the commitment, the commitments that those countries have made to human rights. And so uh, I'd like to just show you a trailer from uh, a longer uh, uh, training piece that uh, we're in the process of finishing on the Yogyakarta Principles. early as when we go to school. When people start learning how to read and write, they should start learning about rights as well. People cannot be violated and discriminated against simply on the basis of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Many governments claim that in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, sexual orientation and gender identity is not mentioned. So they don't feel obligated to protect us. They don't feel obligated to defend our rights. They don't feel obligated to promote respect for LGBT people. In November 2006, a group of human rights experts from 25 countries gathered in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, to outline a set of international principles relating to sexual orientation and gender identity. In this group were judges, professors, lawyers, national human rights commissioners, members of non-governmental organizations, and human rights experts from the United Nations. They came from every region of the world. The result of their collaboration was a set of 29 principles called the Yogyakarta Principles, which cover a broad range of human rights, ranging from equality, non-discrimination, security, privacy, housing, education, freedom of opinion and expression, and peaceful assembly and association. These principles provide guidance on how to apply existing international human rights law to the lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Number one is no discrimination, please. Let's just let people be. Uh, let, respect their privacy, respect their identity. And uh, secondly, the message is no violence, please. Now there's something we could add to promote uh, the LGBT rights, we could use those provisions, very specific provisions, that tackles gender identity and sexual orientation under the law. We have to be proud to be ourselves. We have a purpose in our lives, and I think that God created us, as He meant for us to, to make a change in our community. 
we want that the government or the institutions in one's country will recognize using the Jogjakarta principles the, uh, the rights of lesbians, gays, bisexual people, transgender people, uh, that they are valid and that our rights are equal as anyone's rights. I firmly believe that we move forward together as a movement, leaving no one behind, no neighborhood in Brooklyn, no, no state that hasn't yet passed its laws on non-discrimination, no nation and no region. We move forward together as a movement. We leave no one behind. I hope you um, have heard and seen and from your own travel and experiences have, have gotten that message and that you, you'll join us in that, in that struggle for a, a global LGBT movement that um, is conscious of the needs of, of all of our brothers and sisters around the world. So I thank you very much for your time. Jess? Can I just say something? Come on. Um, before we end, I'd just like to say, um, Aung San Suu Kyi once said, you know, to encourage, she encouraged once the world to use their freedom to promote theirs. And, you know, I, I am sitting here today um, to you, um, asking you to use your relative freedom, and most importantly, the influence of your affluence to promote our freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.